Welcome, everybody. My name is Alden. Uh, I'm here uh, from Valve. I work on the Steam business team. I've got a couple of colleagues here that I'll bring up later to uh, have a Q&A at the end, uh, if I've timed this correctly. Um, there's a lot of things that we could cover in this presentation. But you guys probably all have different levels of experience with Steam, so I've picked some things that I think are most relevant at this time to talk about. Um, if I don't cover a thing that you're particularly interested in, we try to save some Q&A time, uh, Q time at the end, so try to uh, have some questions at the end. Otherwise, we'll, we'll, we can meet out, outside uh, following the presentation if you want to ask us questions individually. Uh, how many of you already have a game on Steam? All right. Uh, how many of you are working on a game that you plan to bring to Steam? And how many people have never heard of Steam? All right. Well, we all know Steam then. That's good. I'm going to talk today. Uh, I'm going to cover a, a few things pretty quickly here, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the Steam platform, uh, just kind of a high-level overview, what, where we're seeing in terms of growth, what the audience looks like. Um, we're then going to go into talking a little bit about details of bringing your game to Steam and the distribution uh, of games on Steam. Uh, sneak peek at some upcoming changes to the Steam store that you might be interested in. Uh, also, a little bit, uh, quick look at some upcoming redesign of the Steam client itself. Um, and then, hopefully, if I've saved enough time, we'll have a Q&A, uh, time for Q&A at the end. So let's get started with kind of where Steam is now. Steam is, has a huge audience worldwide that is growing. Um, and I'm, I'm bringing this up. Oh, there we go. So I'm going to talk about this not just to kind of throw out some big numbers, but because I want to talk about kind of the scope and the scale of opportunity that Steam presents for, your, for connecting your game with customers. So in, as of the last couple of months, we've been seeing peaks concurrent players uh, of 14 million. If you compare that to uh, 2015, there was about 8.4 million. So we're seeing a lot of growth in just how much people are connected to the platform and playing games on any given day. We're also seeing a lot of active players over the course of the day. So 33 million daily active players um, and 67 million monthly active players. And of those players, uh, we're seeing a lot of new customers coming in every month, making their first new purchase on Steam. So if we look back from the beginning of January 2016, we've seen 26 million new customers coming to Steam, making their first purchase. And that translates to about 1.5 million new purchasers every month. This is, it's interesting to talk about new uh, growth in terms of new user acquisition, but what we're also seeing is existing customers buying and playing more games on Steam. So this is a graph of just how many products each individual user on average is buying on Steam over years. So from 20, 2009 to 2016, you can see a lot of growth just in existing customers finding more things to play. Um, and not captured in this graph, but also along with this, is people spending more time playing the games that they buy. So they're not just buying more things, they're actually playing more things as well. Um, in addition to this growth and the, the size of Steam, um, We've been putting a lot of energy into expanding worldwide, and a big part of that is supporting localized currencies, payment methods, making sure that we are where customers want us to be and in the language they want us to be, um, and supporting the, the ways that they, they pay for games. So in the US, we like to buy things with credit cards. Here in Holland, you guys tend to use bank cards or pin cards. In Russia, people walk to a physical kiosk and feed cash into the machine that load up their digital wallet. So there's worldwide 70 different payment methods, different ways that people are feeding money into Steam so that they can buy games. So these are all things that we build out as a platform so that when you bring your game to Steam, it's easy for customers wherever they are to be able to buy your game and, and enjoy it. Um, and then we also have global content servers. Uh, I don't quite know. I think we're up to a couple thousand now. So these are servers that put whatever the, your game content is closest to the customers that are interested in downloading that so that when they go to download the games, they have the best and fastest experience. And as we're seeing all this growth, we're also seeing tremendous diversity in the games that customers are playing. Um, this is just a really quick snapshot of a few, the, the breadth and diversity of games. So there's things like visual novels that even just a couple of years ago didn't exist as a thing on Steam. Um, and what we're seeing with growth, particularly in East Asian countries, is bringing a lot of new kinds of genres and new types of games to Steam that then Western customers are exposed to. 
And along the way, while we're picking up more customers from these East Asian countries, they're then in turn exposed to more Western products developed by Western developers. Um, so we're seeing just a lot, a lot more cross-pollination of different ideas and genres. Um, and so then that means when you bring your game to Steam, there's a lot of customers worldwide that can be exposed to your game. Um, and whatever kind of genre or theme your game has, that there's probably a niche or a segment of the population that's interested in that. So I'll get into a little bit about how we're working on connecting customers with that content a little bit later on. Um, so if we look a little bit about kind of the regional breakdown of where sales are happening on Steam, this has changed a lot even in just the last couple of years. So we can see now that Asia is making up a more and more significant portion of sales. Uh, as, as recently as just a couple of years ago, our markets were really heavily North America, about 45%, Western Europe, about 45%, and then the rest of the world divided up the rest. Uh, we can see that shifting quite a bit uh, as Asia grows quite a bit, Russia continues to grow. Um, and so the segments of the pie are moving around, but also the pie as a whole is also growing in terms of what I mentioned earlier, in terms of customers buying more things. So a lot of opportunities to reach customers in, in growing markets. Um, and the best ways to do that uh, is to think about, as you're rolling out your game, thinking about localization and the, the languages that are, that are most effective to target. So if we look back at kind of the history of, of what, say, big box retail would focus on in terms of localization, uh, they would tend to focus on the, the kind of English and, the, and five major uh, European languages. And what we're seeing now is that a lot of customer trends is that people, even that speak uh, Traditionally, their primary language is, say, one of, the, one of the European languages. They're more willing to play English-only games. But when we look at uh, customers coming from East Asian countries, they often can't understand at all a game if it's not translated into their language. So if you're thinking about where to spend your translation dollars uh, for the games that you're working on, uh, we ran an analysis of games that added translations uh, after release so that we can kind of see what positive impact games had when they added those translations. So for the biggest ones, uh, English is, is the biggest. So, um, and there's, a, there's only a few examples of this where, say, a, a game from a Japanese developer came and didn't, didn't have English and added it later. Turns out a lot of English customer, English speaking customers are actually really interested in those products as well. And then you can see the rest of this list is dominated by East Asian countries, uh, countries where people generally don't speak English at all or they don't speak other languages at all. And so um, the percentages here uh, are for uh, increase of revenue in the region, uh, particular for that language, when that language is added afterwards. So if you have a game that's selling currently and you have some percentage of your sales you see happening in Korea, if you were to translate into to Korean, you could see about 140% increase uh, in sales in Korea. So this is going to vary from game to game, depending on the, the genres of your game and, and how appealing that is to different cu uh, customers in different regions. Um, but this kind of gives, gives you a general idea of, of what we're seeing in terms of growth uh, as a result of localization. So uh, just as a, as a takeaway, Steam is growing. Uh, can, we have a lot of big opportunities to connect with customers worldwide, and we, we put a lot of effort into building out the localization and the, and the currency and, and payment systems to help your game reach as many customers as possible. So then how do you go about distributing your game on Steam, and what does that look like? Um, for any of you that haven't interacted with Steam uh, and Steamworks before, I'll go through that really quickly. So Steam really is a set of APIs that, connects, that can connect your game with a set of, the set of services that Steam uh, offers. And there's, kind of, there's too many features to go into here. Um, but uh, some, of the, some of the really interesting ones are things like Steam Workshop, uh, which help user-generated content be able to integrate with your game, matchmaking services. We've recently been making a lot of improvements on the controller and input APIs so that you can write a c one controller integration that then works with any kind of controller. So, you don't have to go off and author Xbox input separately from PlayStation input separately from PC input. You can author once to the Steam input API, and, th and then those controllers just work. Um, and additionally, Steamworks also encompasses the website that we have for managing your game and your storefront and your presence on Steam. 
So once you're up and running in Steam, you have access to all the tools yourself to manage what your store page looks like, post your own announcements, talk to your customers, configure your games, have different branches, beta branches, generate keys, and whatnot. And all of this comes from selling your game on Steam, plus you can use all these services if you sell Steam keys, if you want to sell them elsewhere as well. We are happy to see you sell your game wherever your customers are. Um, so then how do you bring your game to Steam? Um, just earlier this month, we announced and released a brand new system, streamlined and very predictable path for bringing your game to Steam. So you know, if you, if you might have heard stories in the past of what it's like to bring a game to Steam, and it was hard, and it was confusing and unpredictable, we've changed all of that now with Steam Direct. Um, Steam Direct now is a very transparent path. All you have to do really is fill out some paperwork pay a per app fee the, that's recouped from sales of your game. There's a brief product review process where we launch your game and make sure that it seems like it's configured correctly for the platforms that you intend to release on, make sure that you're describing things in a way that makes sense, and we use that as an opportunity to offer some advice along the way if we can help you make sure your game is described better on your store page or make sure you're showing off your screenshots in the right way. Um, we definitely, it's not as strict or as rigorous as, say, a certification process. It's more of just a lightweight, make sure it's going to run when customers launch your game for the first time so that on day one they have the best possible experience. And then you can release when you're ready. The release button is in your control. Uh, you can have your game up as a kind of coming soon as a preview page, building up an audience for months or even years before you release. And when you're ready to release, the release button is in your hand. So we try to give you guys as much control as we can so that you can run things however it makes sense for you to run. So line up with whatever marketing you have or other plans. And along with all of that, we've been spending a lot of time working on the support that we provide for Steamworks developers. So recently, along with the release of Steam Direct, we've, added, we've, uh, we've done a major overhaul of our Steamworks documentation site. Um, and that really is bringing, adding a lot more documentation to the underlying APIs and just making it generally easier and more friendly to get around and find the information that you need uh, as far as utilizing and integrating with the features of Steam, understanding best practices for how to run your business on Steam, how to use features, so forth and so on. And for things that the documentation doesn't cover or specific questions you may have about your game, we've been working on a, and we, we rolled out a new developer help site that lets you either go through a wizard to find the answer to your question, or uh, ultimately end up in a forum to contact us so that we can give you a personalized answer to, to whatever your question may be. So we're going to continue working on that because we think it's really important to support the developers that are shipping games on Steam and be able to answer your questions so that you can have the best possible release and best possible experience for your customers. So takeaway is it's easy and straightforward to bring your game to Steam. And uh, you can make use of all of our great features and APIs uh, for free. Well, aside from the per app fee. Um, all right, I'll talk a little bit about upcoming store updates. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how best to connect customers with, with games. So I talked earlier about growth around the world. So we're seeing lots of different customers that are playing that enjoy really different kinds of games. And so we still have a lot of customers that love big AAA blockbuster experiences, but we also have tons of customers that love really interesting or different niche products. We have people that play all kinds of different games. So the challenge of the store now is to make sure that we're connecting the right customers with the right games. So uh, and we think it's really important um, that, that we, a small group of people from Valve, are not the ones dictating which games show up to all customers, because we don't think that's the right way to actually serve all the customers. So, some of, the, some of the things that we're working on along those lines. If this works, yeah. So the, the approach that we're taking is to give customers really the, the, the tools that they need to be able to customize and personalize their store. So sorting and filtering and, and different settings that they can say, these are the kinds of co the games that I like and these are the kinds that I don't like. Uh, along with, we're, we're working on a major rewrite of the automatic recommendation system. So that, that would take into account a bunch of playtime data from customers and be able to make recommendations to them based on what they've played in the past, what other people that have played those games also played, what their friends are playing, trying to make re automatic recommendations that are personalized for that individual customer. So that means your game 
can show up to the customers that are most likely to be interested in that game, um, and hopefully then make the best connections possible. Um, and along the way, we're also iterating on the store discovery features themselves, so the way that customers, if they are just kind of browsing around the store, the way that things are surfaced to them, and the way that that store is then influenced by their friends and tastemakers and curators and things like that. So one of the ways that we're going about that is um, the automatic recommendation system can only go so far. It's great for figuring out kind of what trends people, uh, what, what games similar players have, have enjoyed and be able to make recommendations based on that. But we've also heard from customers that there's a strong desire to have humans involved in, in curation. And we know that there's a lot of communities, personalities, brands out on the internet that already are good at highlighting and surfacing interesting titles for the, the customers that follow them or the players that follow them. So, uh, and we have a system in Steam, the Steam curators, that already help surface that content. So if you know PC Gamer and you, you like the recommendations they make, you can follow them on Steam and see their recommendations show up on the front page of the Steam store. We're working on, on integrating that more deeply into more pages. So if you go into subgenre pages, being able to see uh, recommendations from curators in there. Um, and then also along the way, we're updating uh, and making it easy for the other kinds of content that curators create to be surfaced uh, to customers. So this means a, lo a lot of curators, as part of their recommendations, will make videos, or they'll do live streams or broadcasts. So we want to surface all of those things front and center to cu the customers that are following those curators so that they can see what it's actually like to play your game, and they can, he they can see the rich video content that your game produces while the curator is playing it. Um, and then we're also creating a way for curators to create lists of things. So then your game can be potentially part of a, a, either a subgenre that a curator has put together that says, here's the really narrow uh, segment of games that match this, this kind of, so they're, say, multiplayer survival horror games. Here's, here's the top 10. Um, or we, we think uh, curators are also going to put together things like, here's, here's the top five RPGs that you should play in this order to get kind of an overview of how RPGs have progressed through the years. So, we expect curators will do a bunch of interesting things with these lists. Um, and then, like individual curations or games themselves, we'll be putting a bunch of effort into making sure that the right lists are surfaced uh, to the right customers. So this is another way that, you can, that your game can get uh, surfaced and highlighted to customers. And this is the part that's probably most relevant and interesting to you as a game developer, is how do you get your game to those curators? that are most likely interested in your game and have customers and followers that are most interested in your game. So the thing that we're working on now is if you've shifted a game on Steam, you've probably gotten a ton of emails from people claiming that they're YouTubers that have millions of followers and you should send them keys for your game. Uh, most of the time, we've heard that that's not actually true. Those, aren't the people, or those people aren't who they say they are. So we're trying to solve that problem by putting a bunch of that into the Steam system itself so that Curators can come on board. They can, they can do an authentication with their YouTube account. They can do it with their Twitter account, their Facebook account, whatever the major social media accounts are, so that as a developer, you can look through a list of curators. And you can sort and filter them, search for who you think is most interest, uh, who, who curates the kind of games that you make, um, and then be able to verify that they, oh yeah, this person has authenticated their YouTube channel. It does turn out that they have a million and a half followers or whatever. And so that seems like the right person that I should send a copy of my game to. And then make it easy to, for you to send a copy of your game directly through Steam so you don't have Steam keys floating out in the world that can end up uh, in the wrong place. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, we don't have a definite ETA, but we hope sometime in the next couple of months we'll be able to roll that out. Um, and, and along with that, we'll, we hope to also introduce some kind of best practice guidelines for how you can make the most out of that. Along the way, the other thing that we're working on is um, once, once customers find their way to a store page through all the discovery mechanisms that we're working on, we want to make sure that customers have the right information about the game that they're about to buy and so that they can have the proper expectations going into that game. So really, we see that the most happiness that results from customers is if they buy and play a game that they know what they're getting into. Um, so with that in mind, we're working on, we continue to work on Steam user reviews in ways so that the, the most helpful user reviews 
from customers can then be surfaced and made easily presentable on the store page. We're going to make it easier for customers to write reviews for games, leave reviews for games, so that there's just more data on each game. So then when a customer comes in and they're looking at your game, they can get the most accurate idea of whether it seems like the right gaming experience for them or not. And then for those of you that have games that are ongoing living experiences, and even for those of you with single player games, we're working on a major update to our Steam event system. So Steam has had an event system. It's kind of buried and not utilized very well. We're building on that and exposing it in a bunch of places so that for the things that you run in your games, like double XP weekends and play with the developer and watch this guy stream my game live, or um, we're having a contest or a tournament, all of these kind of live events that are happening around a specific time and you really want to re-engage your audience with to come and participate in your game at that moment in time, we're building out a centralized calendar place so that customers can come and see a centralized calendar of events that are upcoming for games that they have, be able to follow those and be, receive some level of notifications as it gets closer to the event, just to, get, to make sure that everybody is informed and ready to come back in and, and participate at the moment that you're having some big event where you want to really get customers to re-engage with. Um, and, then we're, and then we'll build out notifications and reminders into, into Steam um, to make sure that customers are aware that this is happening, aware that it's coming up, and keeping that in mind. So the big takeaway is we're working on a bunch of different aspects of the Steam store to help with discovery, help make sure customers have, in, can make informed decisions about what they're buying, and keep players engaged once they buy your game uh, and, are, and are happy fans of it. Another thing we're working on is a major redesign of the Steam client, which is probably far overdue. Um, so that includes a redesign of the whole Chrome of the Steam desktop client. Um, but I think the, probably the most relevant and interesting thing for you guys is going to be the, the redesigns that we're working on for the Steam library section in particular. So once a customer owns your game, what is that experience like in Steam? So um, well, let's skip forward a couple there. So, there's kind of two big parts of that update in the library. One is going to be a new library home screen. Um, if you've used big picture mode at all um, and you go into your library, there's kind of a similar thing that's in Steam big, big picture mode, which surfaces games that your friends are playing right now. It surfaces things that you've recently played. It surfaces update, recently updated games. We're taking that and we're building on that so that when a customer comes and logs into Steam, if they really just want to go back and play the last game they were playing, it's super easy to launch it right from there. We're not making that any harder. Um, but it also gives an opportunity for, if your game has a big update that's, that just happened, um, that can be front and center for the customers. If your game has a, an event that's happening right now or coming up in the next couple hours or whatever the time frame is, that can be surfaced to them right there. Uh, if a customer comes and their friends are all playing some really cool new multiplayer game, that's surfaced right there so they can jump in and join in that kind of exciting moment in, in gaming time. So, all of these things are going to be rolled together and surfaced on a new library homepage. And then once a user drills into a particular game, um, of course, there'll be the launch button there, but also a really rich experience that pulls in all of the great community content and all the content that you create for your game. So information about, hey, there's this event happening, and here's the details of that event and how you participate. Or we just updated, and here's all the notes about that update, so that when they go into the game, they can have a clear idea jumping in, like, hey, a bunch of things have changed, and here's what you need to know. Um, if, if something is not currently happening like that in the game, it then pulls in community content and surfaces. Here's the cool screenshots being taken. Here's a hot new guide that somebody wrote for this game. Here's videos being uh, shared in this game. And then along the way, things that are relevant to that individual user, such as the achievements that they've earned or screenshots their friends are sharing. Uh, or they can easily watch their friend's game uh, directly from there. Um, so it's really pulling together all of this great content that the community creates, that you create for your game, uh, and putting it in one centralized place in Steam with a much richer presentation. Um, and we're also working on ways that you can personalize or customize that space for your game too. So some branding imagery, maybe some cool interactivity that you can add to that space as well. So we're still working out the details on that, and it's just a little bit too early to actually show screenshots. The rest of the team wasn't quite comfortable showing that yet because things change a lot uh, very quickly. Um, but we hope to be able to share a lot more of that really soon. So the takeaway is 
yeah, we're updating the Steam client UI. Um, things are coming, and that is going to integrate really well with a bunch of the other updates that we're doing, such as the event systems and our update systems. So uh, I guess in conclusion, if you're building a game and you're not intending or you're not considering, haven't thought about bringing it to Steam, we'd like you to think about bringing it to Steam and think about the opportunity available worldwide. Uh, getting set up in Steam is super easy. Um, so we encourage you to take a look at the documentation, uh, take a look at the, the onboarding process. If you haven't signed up yet, uh, it's pretty easy to do so and pretty straightforward. Uh, we've got a lot of great updates coming that benefit you as developers and customers. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we keep doing things to push, push the platform forward and make it more beneficial for developers to have their games on Steam and more beneficial for customers uh, in terms of entertainment value. Um, and also, we want to hear from you. So part of why we're here uh, is to say hello, make sure you get a chance to ask us questions, make sure you get a chance to meet us individually if you want, um, and then feel free to email us as well if you want. I'm happy to give you my business card, and you can come email me uh, or one of my colleagues as well. Uh, and so thank you. That's, that was a brief presentation. Um, we're going to do a little bit of a Q&A now. If you have some particular questions, We'd like you to keep in mind if you have questions that are relevant for the, the group at large. If you have questions that are particular to your specific game, we're happy to chat with you outside afterwards as well. You guys want to come up? So uh, with me up here, I've got, I've got Lawrence. He's a designer working on VR. He can answer VR-related questions. We've got Tom Bowie. He's, work, he's a Steam software engineer, works with me on a lot of the store stuff. Uh, and I've got Jan Peter, who works on the Steam business team on Steam business -y stuff. <laughs> uh, so can, can we answer questions for anybody? Yeah. Um, what is the state of play of freemium titles on Steam from a business point of view? Ooh, I want to clarify that question. What, what is that? So what do you mean what, in particular? What's, what's your view on um, how, how they're doing relative to premium games, whether there's much community backlash for people who don't like sort of pay to win models or microtransactions, but all those kind of issues. Well, what's this, how does that look on Steam mm -hmm. at the moment? Yeah. To a great degree, it's in the execution. I mean, if you look at the Steam charts, uh, among the top titles in there, there's Dota 2, there's CSGO, there's TF2. I mean, CSGO technically is not a freemium game, but uh, it lives on microtransactions uh, for the most part. Uh, customers have shown a lot of unwillingness to uh, pay for core game functionality on Steam, maybe more so than on mobile platforms, specifically when it's about uh, having designed your game to be worse uh, if you don't pay, like you have to grind and then you have to pay to skip uh, let's say a cooldown timer, things like that. I mean, for a lot of people, the user experience is very different uh, for what they're operating in their pocket for games than what they're than the way that they're interacting with games at their PC. Like the PC, it's a dedicated, I want to say, a shrine that you sit down at and spend a chunk of time at. Uh, whereas with a mobile game, I'm fine to just play a couple of rounds at the bus stop and then wait a day until I can do the next uh, move. So I think the way that you want to interact with your audience should respect the way that they use your games. And we have had great success with just adding entirely uh, unnecessary uh, cosmetic items to our games that people who really care about the games uh, can then spend more on it than uh, the average user who will just want to have like the, the minimum experience. Anybody else have questions? Uh, right there. Hello. Very good talk. Thank you. Uh, so what are your thoughts on things like animated GIFs on store pages? Because I know there's kind of a, a silly workaround that a lot of us are using right now. What are your thoughts on that? That's a designer question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we're totally fine with animated GIFs on store pages once you've gotten to your store page. And if we don't support that very well, I think we can probably add better support for that. Um, it's clear that developers often use them in really great ways to show off what it's actually like to play the game. And we think the more information a customer can have going into playing their game, the better. So we're totally in support of that. Probably not in the main key branding image, just because when you have that on a 
page full of moving things, uh, like when you're just browsing the store, that gets a little bit overwhelming. Um, but on a store page, we're, we're happy to support that. How, how are people using them now? Or how do they want to use them? Uh, so right now, you kind of have to save a, a GIF as a PNG and upload it and repoint it, and it works as a GIF. It's not really officially supported, but a lot of store pages have them. Tom will personally fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is this in the main sort of screenshot rotation or just in the body of the... Uh, in the actual, like, store description. Oh, I see. Yeah, you can just support it without yeah. you having to hack it. Yeah, okay, so that's, that's a bug. We, we should fix that. Yeah, since Kip was introduced. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does somebody else back there have a question? Hello, thank you for your talk. So my question is about how the new discoverability algorithm work with visibility rounds. Because before the one million impressions per single visibility round, were expiring pretty quickly, and now uh, the round can run for a couple of weeks and still uh, have only like 10 or 20 percent of one million impressions. Uh, how uh, how it's benefiting <laughs> the yeah. new indie developers that you were pitching that it will improve their visibility of their titles? Sure. Yeah. So um, y you can help me on this too because we worked on this. Um, when we originally introduced the update visibility round feature, what we intended was when, when developers have a major update to their game, that they can push a button to be able to broadcast it to more customers uh, as a way to say, hey, this game is alive. It's, it's awesome. It's great. It's living. Come back. Here's a new reason to come and buy this game if you haven't bought it already. In reality, we saw so many developers misusing that feature that customers just started tuning it out and weren't actually paying attention to that section at all. So we think that there's actually two different features that will benefit developers and customers. One of those is probably something closer to what we have now, which is as a developer, you've shipped an update, and you want to make sure that your existing customers know that they're getting some awesome value out of their game, and there's a reason for them to come back and re-engage. There's a reason for them to tell their friends to come and play their game, join them in this multiplayer game, or to try this new single player game that has a whole new chapter, whatever you've added to it. We think that's maybe even a separate feature from the other part, which is how do, you, how do you promote your game to new customers that are likely interested and make sure that yeah. you ha with, when you have a good reason to tell them something new about your game, that you can do so. So that's a new thing that we're, we're spending time thinking about. We don't, have, we don't have a perfect solution for it yet, so we haven't, we haven't rolled that out. But we think maybe that looks like something along the lines of when you do have an update, there's a button that you can press that will kind of amplify or boost your game uh, in the automatic recommender system so that the people that would likely be exposed to your game or are interested in games like yours will see that, oh, now there's a reason why it's showing up to them, um, that there's a, a new update. The tricky part of that is we need to figure out how um, some other developers that are misusing the feature, uh, how we can kind of filter out that as well and have it, because Again, if it gets misused a bunch, then users will just start tuning it out. So we need to make sure it's finely balanced. But that's definitely something we're spending a lot of time thinking about. Thank you. Um, maybe one thing on top of that, specifically to the question to how it affects uh, developers. So having talked to developers and having run the numbers, uh, it seems that the perceived value of having these buttons that will give you automatic visibility rounds is much higher than the actual value that they got out of them. Because uh, it was just a scattershot approach. Anybody without any kind of targeting would see those units, and they wouldn't actually have uh, conversions based on that. Where when you actually look at the numbers, while it's, 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 it's usually something you like, having this kind of agency. Now I can push a button, and I feel like I'm in control of something positive happening to my game. If you actually look at the numbers, uh, developers are better off now with the fewer uh, views they have, but to better targeted customers. Does anybody else have other general questions down here in the front?
Hi. Um, for your VR title, would it be possible to create also like a 360 image or 360 video to have like your audience preview uh, imagery or videos in 360? You guys want? Um, so as part of the, the Steam client update, uh, one of the things we're looking at is what that experience is like across all of our different media. So there's the desktop experience and also the, what that looks like in VR. And that exact thing is something we're looking at is how does the store look in VR and what, what can we use in VR to better help customers understand what the game is like. Uh, as Alden said, nothing is set in stone yet, but a better way to represent VR games in VR is definitely on the docket. Yep. Um, nothing to speak to specifically. Now, this is not specifically 360, but uh, I don't know if you're aware that you can embed Sketchfab content in your store page. So you can uh, embed a 3D model, uh, like a static model, that people can look at in the store page on the 2D client. OK, thanks. Anybody else? Inside. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> okay. So I have two general questions. One is very general. When can we order Knuckles controllers? <laughs> can you tell? Uh, yeah. Short answer, not yet. Uh, <laughs> as you may have heard, we have shipped out uh, some hardware dev kits for Knuckles to, to a few developers. We're still in the early stages of gathering feedback. Um, so it's just a small group right now, and we're looking to broaden that in the future. Uh, and you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks and months. OK, thanks. And yeah, the other one is more on the talk, I think. <laughs> so um, in general, I think Steam gets sometimes a bit of a bad rap by some people who say, oh, you don't care or something like that. But I think the, the type you run the ship is basically very lenient, and you basically have to balance a lot. You know, so many games, and you want to have it open to indies, but also not have everyone flood shit on there. And so I, I personally understand that you changed you know, from the green light model away. But, uh, and now you have this uh, entry fee model, and this costs you know, a low fee, a low fee per month. You know? And I wondered, but how are you already having plans? Like, what do you do when now everyone can pay this fee easily, or at least a lot of people, <laughs> and they flood the sto sh uh, store way more? And is it like a plan, like maybe? do an increase in fee each game you release per year, and then next year you have to pay the small entry fee again with your first game, or is it based on ratings you get as average, or something like that? So I, I think we could talk a little bit about the history of how we ended up where we did with that fee. Um, so when, as we were leading up towards Steam Direct, uh, we, we rolled out a series of blog posts that kind of talked a little bit about our line of thinking and our philosophy. And early on when we were thinking about, when we were planning for this transition, we were thinking, what, what would be a reasonable fee? And, and our, our line of thinking was, well, let's make, it, let's make it $500. Anybody can afford $500 if they're serious about making a game. But the more that we learned from feedback, uh, once we kind of asked developers and customers what, what seemed like a reasonable price, is that there's a lot of countries where $500 is an incredible amount of money. Um, and we didn't want to go down the path of having localized pricing uh, for the developer fee, because then it incentivizes people to set up kind of publisher houses in different countries that have a lower app fee than others. And you know, all of this stuff, like we're all game designers, so we think about how do we game the system? How do we, <laughs> how do, we do that? So as we're designing all these systems, we have to think about how they're going to be gamed and abused. Um, and then when we got down to it, we thought, well, we really we want, we want it to be accessible as possible for developers wherever they are. Uh, if they're in lower income countries or if they're in rich countries, we want them to be able, the people that are making interesting gaming experiences to be able to bring those to Steam and connect them with customers. And so if we follow that line of thought, then we think, OK, well, how do we make it easy for those developers to bring their games? And then if we have a bunch of games on the store, well, then the problem is how do we make sure that the, the right games show up to the right customers, right? So, over the years we've been working, we, we did a major discovery update in 2014 to really overhaul and change how the store works and make it more personalized. 
We did another one in 2016 that really makes it even more personalized and customizable. And so all of these changes have given us a lot of confidence that when a lot of games are coming through the system, that they are, they're actually able to, to reach the right customers. And if there's games coming through the system that nobody's actually interested in, they actually they end up not showing up to very many people. So we, we can see, and, and, and we keep testing this, we see titles come through that we're like, oh, this seems like a neat title. Maybe more people are interested in it. So we'll run an experiment, and we'll boost it and show it to more people. And it turns out that the system seems to be roughly working the way that we expected. So when we boost it to more people, we actually don't see a very big increase in the number of people buying it, because it had already reached the number of people that the system had figured out who was appropriate for that game. So that gives us all more confidence that a bunch of, a bunch of low effort, low quality games coming into the system are actually not having an adverse impact on the high quality and really thoughtful and creative projects that are being created. And so we're going to keep working on that to make sure that that holds true and make sure that we can continue to support new titles coming on and make sure that new titles, that brand new release titles, at least can show up to enough people that the system then can then have confidence to show whether, to decide whether people are interested in that title or not. So these, these are all things that we're thinking a lot about, but we think at the end of the day that by having a high fee, all we do is keep out a bunch of interesting, innovative projects that could end up in front of customers. And the more that we looked at the things coming through Greenlight, there's a lot of things coming through that just totally surprised us. And some of those are from places that are unexpected. And I think if we had a higher app fee, some of those might think, some of those developers might either not bring their products or think twice about whether they can afford to or whether it makes sense. And maybe they target a different platform or somewhere where they can't reach the customers that are really the most interested in their game. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else have questions? Nope. All right. We'll wrap it up. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.